<laughs> All right, uh, I'll start off with a trip announcement, which is one of the world's worst kept secrets, um, and that is that the Secretary General will be heading to the 27th UN Climate Change Conference of Parties, otherwise known as COP27, uh, which you all know is being held in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. And as he just told you a short while ago at the conference, he'll be urging countries to increase their political will to act on this on the issue of climate change. And he will call for a pact in which developed countries deliver on the commitments made in Paris and make an additional effort to reduce emissions in line with the 1.5 degrees goal. They must also provide financial and technical assistance, along with support from multilateral development banks and technology companies to help emerging economies speed up their renewable energy transition. Throughout the conference, the Secretary General will also meet with various leaders and climate activists, including young people. Then uh, from there, on November 10th, the Secretary General will help head to Phnom Penh in Cambodia, where he will address the ASEAN UN and, uh, Summit, uh, focusing on regional and global trends, the climate emergency, and the situation in Myanmar. From there, he will push uh, further east, and he will travel to Bali in Indonesia to uh, attend the annual Group of 20 Summit, where he will address sessions on food and energy security and on health, and we'll have more uh, travel to announce later. Um, I'm sure you all heard the Secretary General this morning tell you that he brings that uh, he flagged uh, the fact that we the Black Sea Grain Initiative had hit a new milestone, and that is 10 million metric tons of grain and other foodstuff having been shipped through the Black Sea Corridor. The initiative is working, he said. It is our collective responsibility to keep it working smoothly. On Ethiopia, he called the agreement reached yesterday a critical first step that paves the way for unimpeded delivery of life-saving humanitarian aid and the resumption of public services. And as he heads to Sharm el-Sheikh, the Secretary General said it is time for a historic pact between developed and emerging economies. Also on the Black Sea Grain Initiative, the Joint Coordination Center in Istanbul says that today seven vessels carrying 290,102 metric tons of grain and other food products are transiting uh, the Maritime Humanitarian Corridor under the agreement uh, of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Um, today, the Russian Federation delegation resumed its work at the Joint Coordination Center and joined vessel inspections. I also want to flag that the Joint Coordination Center website on the initiative is now updated with live information on all shipments and is making available detailed data and totals of commodities and destinations. For its part, our friends at the World Food Program noted that since the signing of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, WFP has transported more than 220,000 metric tons of wheat grain from Ukrainian ports intended for the hungriest in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Yemen. A further 160,000 metric tons is planned for transportation to the most uh, vulnerable. Um, this morning, the Secretary, Secretary General spoke at the Security Council, open debate on integrating effective resilience building in peace operations for sustainable peace. He reminded council members that local and global contexts in which our peace missions operate are becoming ch more challenging by the day. In this context, our peace operations must be empowered and equipped to play a greater role in sustaining peace at all stages of the conflict and all its dimensions. The Secretary General highlighted four priorities. First, he said we must deepen engagement with local communities and promote more responsive and inclusive government institutions. Second, bolster the leadership of women and youth. Third, we need a more holistic and integrated approach to building resilience and sustaining peace. Finally, he called on the international community to invest in peace and scale up, um, scale up funding. Um, you will have seen today the UN Environment Program released its Adaptation Gap Report, which finds that global efforts in adaptation, planning, financing, and implementation are not keeping pace with the growing risks. UNEP estimates that adaptation costs are five to ten times greater than international adaptation finance flows to developing countries. In his message, the Secretary General said that the adaptation must be treated with seriousness that reflects the equal worth of all members of the human family. Um, update on Ethiopia's, uh, on the humanitarian front on Ethiopia, um, our 
colleagues are in contact with the government of Ethiopia and others to resume as soon as possible the movement of aid convoys and personnel to Mekele and Shire. Uh, convoy by roads from Tigray to Afar uh, had been suspended since August 24th. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that critical supplies, including food, nutrition items, medicines, are running very low in Tigray. Meanwhile, we, along with our humanitarian partners, continue to distribute aid in the, uh, using the remaining stocks in the region, and we started to assist those who are currently accessible, uh, in accessible areas. Last week, about 189,000 newly displaced people in the northwestern zone were assisted with food, and around 6,000 displaced people from afar received food assistance in southeastern zone. Food distribution also started in Mekele City last week, targeting about 50,000 people. In Amhara and Afar, our humanitarian partners continue to respond to the humanitarian needs, including in places of returns, as access has improved, allowing humanitarian partners to reach areas that were so far inaccessible, including north of Kobo. Access, um, access assessments to additional areas are ongoing. In Afar, our partners have reached more than 613,000 people. That's 95% of the targeted population, with food assistance for the current food distribution round. In Amhara, more than 2.1 million people received food assistance last week. However, huge response gaps remain in other sectors, mainly due to lack of resources, including water, non-food items, health, and education support. Um, excuse me. Uh, just staying in... Uh, in Africa and moving to uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Our peacekeeping mission there uh, is telling us that the situation in North Kivu remains relatively calm today. However, movements by the M23 were reported around Mabenga, 25 kilometers northwest of Ruchuru and in Virunga National Park. The mission continues to support the government and the armed forces to keep civilians safe from harm and restore peace in the east of the country. Finally, yesterday in Bukavu, in the South Kivu province, civil society groups organized a peaceful protest against M23 aggression in, uh, that's ongoing in North Kivu. They also encouraged a massive participation in a nationwide demonstration planned on November 9th. And in Mali, our peacekeeping mission there has worked to increase the capacity of hospital rooms at the Bamako Central Prison from 19 to 30 beds. This will help alleviate challenges related to prison overcrowding. In addition to this, in the past two months, the mission has provided first aid training to 36 prison guards, health and social workers, including 11 women in five correctional facilities. These efforts are part of a broader project to improve detention conditions and to facilitate access to health care for prisoners. The UN mission continues to support the national authorities in charge of prison administration, to test security plans, build capacity for the management of incidents in prison, and to improve the performance of prison intervention brigade, which is playing a key role in the surveillance of detainees accused of terrorism since its operationalization in September of 2021. And turning to Somalia, the humanitarian coordinator there, uh, Adam Abdelmula, allocated today $17 million from the Somali Humanitarian Fund to provide immediate aid to communities in areas of the highest risk of famine. As we've told you several times, famine is knocking on the door in Somalia and millions of people are at risk of starvation unless humanitarian assistance is scaled up and sustained. This new allocation will fund immediate life-saving activities at a time when humanitarian operations are struggling to keep up with the scale, scope, and severity of the needs. The funds will focus on the worst affected communities in Bay, in Bakul, and Mudug. This comes at a critical time in the number of people impacted by the droughts has more than doubled since the beginning of the year. This means that 7.8 million men, women, and children are now affected. The humanitarian response plan for Somalia requires $2.27 billion to respond to the needs of all those affected. Donors have already provided $1.07 billion, which is just under half of what we need. Um, we need more. Um, and as we mentioned a few days ago, uh, in Niger, the central Sahel region is currently facing severe flooding. Today, um, 
uh, our latest update from Niger, where heavy rains are continuing to claim lives and wreak havoc on homes and infrastructure. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that more than 330,000 men, women, and children are now impacted by floods in all eight regions of the country. Since the rain started in July, 195 people have died, more than 200 people have been injured, and more than 36,000 homes have collapsed. In the southern regions of Zinder and Maradi have been hit particularly hard with entire neighborhoods submerged. The agricultural sector throughout the country is also impacted. We, along with our humanitarian colleagues, are providing support to the government, delivering essential items. The 2022 Humanitarian Response Plan for Niger is looking for $552 million. Um, it is only 42% funded. And in neighboring Nigeria, the humanitarian coordinator there, Matthias Schmal, called on the international community to support the country as it faces unprecedented floods, which have impacted more than 3 million people. More than 130,000, uh, more than 100,000 hectares of farms have been flooded, uh, damaged, sta damaging staple food crops such as cassava, rice, and plantain. This will ag aggravate the already alarming food and nutrition crisis across uh, Nigeria. As flood waters recede, uh, priority is to help people get back to what is left of their homes and regain lost assets and livelihoods. We are working together with the government, doing the best we can to provide aid, but additional funding is uh, needed. And one last uh, note from the um, on hunger. Uh, the World Food Program today says that warned that hunger and malnutrition is on the rise in South Sudan, with some communities likely to face starvation if humanitarian assistance is not sustained and climate adaptation <coughs> measures are not scaled up. The latest integrated food security phase classification released today shows about two-thirds of South Sudanese people, that 7.76 million people, are likely to face acute food insecurity during the April-July 23 lean season, while 1.4 million children will be malnourished. Uh, much more on the WFP website. Some good news uh, from Zambia, which yesterday celebrated getting 70 percent full COVID vaccination coverage. Huge progress from less than 3 percent just a year ago. This translates in over 8 million people being uh, the target adult population being vaccinated. The UN team, led by resident coordinator Beatrice Mutali, has been contributing to this milestone with support of WHO. Uh, authorities upgraded technology and provided vaccination cards, strengthened COVID-19 surveillance and other assistance. For its part, UNICEF supported the provision of over 20 million doses of various other vaccines and also strengthened the cold chain. Um, note from this hemisphere and Haiti, uh, um, noting that High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, warned that armed violence there has precipitated Haiti's descent in the worst human rights and humanitarian situation in decades. Our human rights colleagues in Haiti said in just over a week in mid, uh, over a week in mid October, more than 71 people were killed. 12 women were raped and hundreds of residents were forced to flee their homes as a result of turf wars between rival gangs in Croix de Bouquet, which is Port-au-Prince's metropolitan area. That's according to information we received. At least 54 people were killed during protests since August, most of them allegedly because of disproportionate use by a force by the police. For its part, the UN Refugee Agency is calling on states in the region and beyond to suspend the forced return of Haitians to their country. Um, in view of the current situation, UNHCR is encouraging governments to ensure that Haitians have access to protection services and support regardless of their reasons for leaving Haiti. And also to note the UN ECOSOC Ad Hoc Advisory Group on Haiti has also issued a statement today expressing its concern about the situation there. A couple of programming notes. Tomorrow, my guest will be Upali Galketi Arechilage, a senior economic economist for the FAO. He will join us virtually to talk about the monthly world FAO food price index, and that's for October. 1 p.m. hybrid briefing here by Ambassador Federico Villegas, president of the Human Rights Council. Um, heads up that our 2022 UN International Media Seminar on Peace in the Middle East started uh, today and will continue today and tomorrow in Geneva. The event is organized by the UN Department of Global Communications in the context of its General Assembly mandated 
special information program on the uh, question of Palestine. And lastly, a reminder, if you're interested, our former boss, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, will be in the building tomorrow at an event in the Dag Hammarskjöld Library 315 on the unveiling of his uh, collection of archives and papers. You are all warmly invited. Mr. Bayes. So start off with Ethiopia. You read various humanitarian notes there, but mm -hmm. the UN has all along wanted unimpeded humanitarian access. You haven't got that yet. What are you hearing from the authorities? No, not, 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 as, of, uh, not as of today, which is, I mean, uh, uh, the agreement was um, agreed upon yesterday. It's not, uh, it's not surprising that it may take a little bit of time uh, to get the word out uh, to the competent authorities in the field. We are in touch with them and trying to get that unimpeded access uh, as soon as possible. And the other thing that you were demanding was the withdrawal of Eritrean forces. Is that part of the agreement, and are you expecting that to happen imminently? Uh, it's something we are still calling for. I, I think I would refer you to the agreement to see if that's in there. I don't think the, agree okay. the full agreement has been made public. Okay, I haven't right. seen, I personally haven't seen the full and agreement. Can I also ask you about a different subject, which is um, the... Um, shooting of Imran Khan. Um, he has survived being shot in the legs, but it may well have been an assassination attempt. What is the Secretary General's reaction to that event, but also how worried is he about the, um, the political situation in Pakistan that was al already yeah. very tense? Well, I mean, we're obviously very concerned about the, the reports that we've heard of the uh, of the that former Prime Minister Imran Khan and others uh, were wounded today during a rally. Uh, we condemn in the strongest possible term any uh, political violence, any violence, excuse me, against politicians uh, or their supporters. Um, first of all, we hope that Mr. Khan and, and anyone else who was wounded um, uh, recovers uh, quickly. It is very important that there be a full uh, and transparent investigation into what happened. We very much hope that this will not uh, create um, further uh, challenges to the political situation in Pakistan. Mr. Klein. Yes, uh, now that um, Russia has uh, resumed its participation in the Black Sea Grain Initiative, uh, th through a, in part the efforts of the Secretary General and, uh, and Turkey, could you uh, now provide us a little bit more details on whom the Secretary General spoke with uh, in, the, in the Russian Federation and what concerns and comments he may have on President Putin's warning yesterday that Russia reserves the right to withdraw from the initiative uh, you know, at its discretion. Thank Look, you. I mean, the, the parties, uh, parties to, to the agreement have a right to, to withdraw. I mean, that's just a statement of, uh, of a fact. Uh, we are continuing our contacts with 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 all the parties. We've the Secretary General, I think, uh, expressed his clear determination uh, to see uh, the agreement uh, extended uh, and fully implemented. We very much hope that will happen. Um, the Secretary General is very wedded uh, to his uh, his discreet diplomacy, so I won't expand on the contacts beyond what I said uh, yesterday. Madame. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, just a uh, follow up on the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Um, today in the morning, the spokesperson of Putin, Peskov, he said, um, announced the information that um, they will, about the prolonging the initiative, that probably they will just need to go through all this effectiveness of this initiative for all the sides. Um, and then they will decide. From your perspective, can it be considered as a hint of another Russian blackmail? I, I take the words exactly as they are, is that they, the, the parties want to look at the, the Russians want to look at the agreement. I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of public talk. Uh, our position uh, remains the same. We are determined uh, to see the extension of the deal. Uh, I'm not going to provide, you know, call or commentary on, on what, people, what people are saying. We're, we're trying to keep a very serious focus on this. 
Benno. If you raise your hand, you've got to be ready, Benno. I'm sorry. Um, I'm a bit confused about the extension of the grain deal because, I mean, like you mentioned more than once, there will be an automatic uh, extension. It says so in the deal itself. Mm -hmm. The Russians, I think today, said, no, there will be no automatic extension. Um, Extensions. What do you make out of this? Does that mean I, I, I you're think, thinking listen, about I, I negotiations? Don't, I, I don't make anything out of anything, right? Uh, we have time until uh, the initial deadline. Discussions are going to continue. Um, all that I know right now is that the initiative is is working. Uh, the parties are in Istanbul. Uh, ships are being inspected. Food is flowing, uh, and we very much hope that that will continue. It seems that the Russians are pushing for new negotiations or uh, something like this. Will you know, you, will you you'd have to ask the this? you'd have to ask the foreign ministry. I, I'm, I'm, I can barely speak for my own boss. Uh, I can't speak for others. Uh, any other questions? Ephraim, and then we'll go to James. I don't know. What, Paulina's here. Yeah. Just curious about the Zambia good story, since we always talk about yes. the discrepancy of yeah, yeah. you know Africa and the rest yeah. of the world. What are the elements of Siklak? Like, how did that happen? How how what actually worked? How the el the elements of success is uh, very close cooperation and support of the UN and the government, uh, ensuring uh, that the solidarity between the North and the South, global North and the global South, exists. Um, to also have strong institutions. Um, and, and I think political will from a government uh, to, see sing, thing, to see things through. Mr. Bayes. Um, so um, North Korea has launched, it seems to be a failed launch of an ICBM and other projectiles. Um, we seem to get numerous in incidents, if not every day, almost every day, of North Korea doing something. And really, there doesn't seem to be much of a response coming from either the Security Council or the Secretariat. It's not something you, every day, come out and, in your opening statement, say, North Korea's done this, it, the Secretary General's deploring it. I mean, everyone seems to be ignoring what is well, a very I, serious situation. I, I, I can tell you something we're not uh, ignoring in the least. Um, I think it is very important uh, that we see a stop uh, to these multiple uh, missile launch. A number of them are clear violations of the Security Council resolution. It is also important uh, in this to hear uh, strong, unified words uh, from the Security Council. And has the Secretary General been in touch with anyone on the North Korea issue in the last week or so? Uh, not in the last uh, couple of days that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, I've left this to the end. But, um, you know what I mean? No, 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 no. You know what no, I'm going to bring no, up? No, no, um, no, no. The escalator is still not fixed. Um, I wonder if you have any update on this. Is it the, is it the, um, the UN facilities department that is responsible for fixing it? There are signs on it that say Otis on it, or is it the Otis Elevator Company? Which yeah, I, think I has, mean, the, has, the Otis uh, Elevator uh, Company uh, is, is, has a very is long a venerable, venerable very, uh, company. A venerable company yeah, on, the on escalators. of the elevators. Well, exactly, the escalator, exactly. Yeah. Escalators and elevators, a very venerable history. Yeah. So um, can they be happy that in this historic and politically significant building right next to the Security Council, there is an escalator that sits and does I, absolutely I am, I, nothing. I have, I have no doubt that Otis is never happy until all escalators and all ev elevators are functioning properly. Um, they have a long and successful history in, in the escalator. Are you angling for a new job? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I, I, I don't mean to make light. Um, they, are, they are indeed the contractor responsible uh, for the maintenance of the uh, escalators and, and the elevators. They are looking for the spare part, uh, trying to, uh, these elevators unfortunately are old. It is not that easy to make these spare parts. They, they, they would, I have no doubt that they would like to see that uh, yellow warning uh, sign taken out as quickly as possible. Maybe they can look in the Otis Museum for the spare part and quickly I don't know if there's an Otis Museum. Yeah. Mm. Okay, on that note, uh, I don't know if, uh, oh, Joe, did you have a question? 
Well, uh, it was just sort of a facetious follow-up, but as, 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 <laughs> Go ahead. it might as well be Friday, right? Has 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 anyone escalated the escalator ah. situation up the chain of management? Are you here all notice? week? <laughs> up no. Are notice. you here all week? Was I here all week? No, you here. I'm just, it's a <laughs> no. comedy joke. Yeah, yeah. I'm well, here, all, I'm here all week. That's I don't know fair. if you are. Yeah. Uh, yes, the the senior most management in our facilities department are fully aware of the es of the escalator issue. Well, I know I'm talking about within Otis's management. I, I don't That's, that I, that you know I I don't speak for the Ukrainian government. I don't speak for the Russian government, and I don't speak for the Otis Elevator Company. That's fair. Go ahead, Miriam. Thank you. Um, Taliban stormed a press conference in Kabul. Um, press Sorry? The Taliban uh -huh. stormed a uh, press conference in Kabul, and they um, took uh, some of the women um, with them, charged them. Um, these women were there to announce the um, a women's movement um, organization. So nobody knows where are these women right now. Have you heard anything from your That's office? That's the first I've, I've heard of it. I will look into it right away. Okay. okay. Another question. Amnesty International um, announced today that um, 70, um, almost 800,000 people signed a letter uh, from um, around the world, asked um, the um, United Nations and also a human rights council to start a mechanism on uh, uh, human rights um, um, repression in Iran. Have you heard anything about this letter? And what well, does I mean, the secu uh, Secretary the, General think I mean, think the about Secretary General, I think, has been very clear in his uh, expressing his direct concern, both publicly and privately, uh, at the ongoing situation in Iran. The creation of a mechanism would depend on member states. Okay. What does he think about the mechanism? Sorry, I don't I, know. As I said, the, the, the decision is whether or not to create a mechanism just depends on member states. Uh, I don't see Paulina. I, she may not be briefing today. She canceled. Well, then, au revoir. <laughs>